It isn't often that a father buys his son a minor league hockey team, but it's even rarer when the father places his son in charge of that hockey team. But that's exactly what Jimmy Galante did for his then high school son, AJ. Back in 2004, Jimmy Galante, a waste disposal mogul, purchased an expansion hockey team for $500,000 as a present for his son. They named the team the Danbury Trashers as an homage to the family business. There's a good chance you've never heard of this team, not unless you lived in Connecticut or you were a fan of the defunct United Hockey League. AJ's journey into hockey began when he was around seven or eight years old. He explained that his mother once took him to see the Mighty Ducks on a Saturday afternoon, and that was when he fell head over heels for the game. But he never played the game before, nor did he grow up in a hockey-loving family. Instead, he got a pair of rollerblades and some street hockey equipment to grow his love for the sport. Danbury didn't have an ice rink at the time, so AJ taught himself to skate and even learned to play the game all by himself. His father took him to his first NHL game between the New Jersey Devils and the Pittsburgh Penguins. He was introduced to Scott Stevens, the former Washington Capitals defenseman. Starstruck, AJ wanted to be just like him, an enforcer who throws a punch. And since AJ grew up an aggressive kid, hockey served to be an outlet for his aggression. AJ started off as a forward, then switched to defense to get more ice time and further build on his physical game. He threw around his weight and delivered crushing hits. He loved the bad boy persona. A catastrophic injury would however end his young playing career before it ever really got off the ground. But his father assured him hockey wasn't over with him just yet. And that's why in 2004, Jimmy Galante decided to do a surprising and shocking move to the community. He gave AJ the job of general manager of the Danbury Trashers in order to cheer him up after his on-ice injury. AJ quickly took to the new job and started building his dream team, a team full of tough guys who racked up penalty minutes as easy as they breathed. AJ gave his team the objective of their game, and that was to be the toughest team around. The first player the team signed was forward Brad Wingfield. He was a Canadian tough guy who had 576 penalty minutes on his previous team. Then there were other tough guys, such as John Nasty Morasty, Frank the Animal Bialois, and Dave McIsaac. AJ even had the luck and the touch to sign players with NHL experience because of the NHL lockout that was happening at that time. They had Ruman Nigerian Nightmare Endure and even Mike Rupp, only two years removed from scoring the game-winning goal in Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final. But to cap it all off, AJ would sign Brent Gretzky, brother to the great one Wayne Gretzky, to serve as captain of the team. The Danbury Trashers established themselves as the bad boys of hockey. Perhaps this was pure minor league hockey skill level at its worst, but it was a hit, with most games throughout the season getting packed to the brim with fans looking for a show. There were many signature nights for the Trashers during their two years of dominance in the league. The Trashers lived up to their tough guy mentality from the get-go, and broke the UHL record for penalty minutes with 2,776 in their inaugural season. The Trashers were involved in the league's biggest brawl that season that happened after the injury of Trashers star Brad Wingfield. On December 1, 2004, the Trashers were hosting the Kalamazoo Wings, and Brent Gretzky was being outplayed by Kalamazoo defenseman Josh Elzinga. So Brad Wingfield challenged Elzinga to a fight, reinforcing the Trashers' image. Elzinga refused, but as soon as Wingfield moved away, he stuck out his skate and grabbed Wingfield's jersey. Wingfield went down awkwardly, breaking his left leg. Then everything on the ice went out of control. One player, Ruman Endur, allegedly kicked a referee. Even owner Jimmy Galante got involved, and he allegedly came down from the owner's box and punched a ref. But that night wasn't even the rowdiest night in the history of the Trashers. On the night of February 23, 2005, the Trashers hosted their rivals, the Adirondack Frostbite. That particular night, a VIP was in town to sign autographs for the fans at the Danbury Arena, WWE superstar John Cena. With Cena on hand to hype up an already rowdy crowd, the hostile environment paved way to what infamously happened on the ice later that night. AJ had told the team to put on a show prior to the game. Throughout the season, there was pretty much a fight at every single game, but this was a full-scale brawl like no other before. One Trasher player, appearing in only his second game for the team, got into a fight with three opposing players. He was sent to the penalty box for fighting. After his time was up for fighting, he then went over to the opposing team's bench, grabbed their coach Mark Potvin by the tie, and tried to pull him over the boards. For this stunt, 
he got suspended for life by the league. And this epitomized the brand of hockey the Trashers played during their time in the league. Throughout the tumultuous ups and downs surrounding the team, the Danbury Trashers cemented their legacy in hockey history. Whether people liked the Trashers hockey or not, the team was always entertaining. And through fighting and physicality, the baddest, roughest, toughest team gave Danbury, Connecticut an identity. The Trashers finished second in the Eastern Division, but were eliminated in the second round. At first glance, a second place finish in their division may seem like overachieving, but even with an emphasis on fighting, there was still so much skill on the team. And because of a combination of good hockey and better entertainment, the Trashers were a fan favorite. They won the UHL Merchandiser of the Year award in their first season, after selling the most merchandise out of any team in the league. The following year, the Trashers went on a rampage to win the Eastern Division because of their multiple winning streaks over the course of the season. However, they ultimately fell short in the finals against the Kalamazoo Wings. The Danbury Trashers' rise to stardom wasn't unnoticed. People started picking up on the unequivocal fact that although being a small market minor league hockey team, the then 17-year-old AJ was somehow able to pull off signings and trades for players way out of his price range. AJ was only picking the players on his team from reading and watching the players who had the best fights on tape, and somehow he was picking the right players. And why were they deciding to play for the Trashers? With suspicion on his team growing, Jimmy Galante was soon put on the spot. Investigators started looking into how Galante was able to sign players whose contracts combined were approximately three times larger than the league's salary cap. When AJ set his eyes on Brent Gretzky, he turned the deal over to his father. The UHL had a salary cap limited to $275,000 for the entire roster. But the problem was Gretzky reportedly earned $100,000. That meant there wouldn't have been enough money remaining to pay for a contending team. But Jimmy had already thought about that problem. He got around it in the classic mob fashion, no-show jobs. Several players and their wives were on the payrolls of Jimmy's various companies, according to the indictment filed with the U.S. District Court in Connecticut. The Trashers' reported budget came in under the cap, but the feds would later claim that the actual figure for the 2004 and 5 season was closer to $750,000. By the spring of 2005, a handful of agents were already deep into the investigation of Galante's garbage business. According to the subsequent indictment, the investigation was part of an effort to thwart, quote, illegal practices in the trash hauling industry. It had all been kickstarted by a single complaint, most likely from a competitor. Someone tipped off the FBI and said that Galante was monopolizing regional garbage collection and driving out competitors. A different anonymous source had said Galante's enterprise promoted a climate of fear amongst his competitors. Galante's associates had once burned a competitor's garbage truck to send a message to stay out of the Connecticut market. The FBI then sent an undercover agent to pass himself as a rogue salesman to befriend the men around Galante. Within weeks, the agent was seated beside the boss in the owner's box in the Danbury Ice Arena, cheering the trashers on. By then, the US Attorney's Office learned enough to get wiretaps and eventually search warrants. The wiretaps caught Galante's associates talking about a trip to Mount Kisco, New York. The purpose of the trip was to, quote, retain the services of a leg breaker known as the carpenter. Also caught on tape was Galante telling his associate to deliver a message saying Long Island says hello, referring to Matty the Horse Iron Yellow, the successor to Vincent the Chin Gigante and the boss of the Genovese crime family. In the summer of 2005, federal agents raided Galante's offices and came away with more than $500,000 in cash and more than 5,000 boxes of documents that included receipts and account books. According to the indictment, Galante was making quarterly payments of $30,000 to Matty the Horse. These payments were considered a mob tax to ensure Galante's supremacy in the trash trade. In addition, they also came across evidence of the no-show jobs, which resulted in additional charges against Galante. On June 9, 2006, Jimmy Galante was arrested not long after losing the final game of the season. Galante was charged with 72 counts, including extortion, witness tampering, and racketeering. Among the people named was Trasher's coach J. Todd Sterling, who pled guilty to taking part in salary cap fraud. Jimmy Galante pled guilty to one count of racketeering conspiracy, one count of conspiring to defraud the IRS, and one count of conspiring to commit wire fraud. He was sentenced to 87 months in prison, and the government came in and seized most of his assets, including 25 trash companies and a string of race cars. But most importantly, they seized the team. 
The Trashers folded three days after Galante's arrest, ending their legendary run on the big stage. As for what came after the Trashers, AJ graduated from Manhattanville College with a business major and got a job with a local heating oil company. But admittedly, AJ said that life was tough, especially after the family incident and losing the team. He described it as a breakup and stopped watching hockey completely until around 2018. But AJ found a new love, boxing. Located just half a mile from the Danbury Arena, AJ opened Champs Boxing Club. According to an interview, he said he's now working to turn Danbury into a boxing mecca. The old Danbury Arena has returned to its former existence as a youth rink, but AJ and his story has lived on. There's been a lot more publicity ever since Netflix's trending documentary, Untold, Crime and Penalties, with one of its episodes featuring the Danbury Trashers. And it wasn't only the people from Danbury who were supportive of AJ's endeavors. It was coming from across the world, from such celebrities as Drake and Tyson Fury. Drake had even asked him for a Trashers jersey right after the documentary was released. AJ also got recognition from brands such as WWE and Barstool Sports. In AJ's words, quote, it has just been a whirlwind of emotions. Today, AJ's father, Jimmy Galante, is once again a free man. He got out of prison in 2014. When asked about what he's up to these days, he simply said, quote, enjoying life. Click to watch one of these next videos and let us know in the comment section who you think is the worst sports team owner out there.